Well, thank you for joining this online service, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, whether you're listening by CD or dial a sermon. We do welcome you as we come together on this 17th of May 2020, the latest Sunday in lockdown. And thankfully this week there have been a little bit of signs of hope as it seems that lockdown is eventually and finally being lifted. But I'm sure all of us have had very much in our hearts and minds and prayers this week, the Smith family outside Bally Castle. That terrible road accident when Claire was left dead, a 35-year-old mother, along with her little daughter, Bethany. And the other little girl, Hannah, left fighting for her life in the Royal Victoria Hospital. And we think of them today, of Hannah and Father Ryan, as they bury uh, mother and daughter. And we want to pray for that family and for the Reverend John Stanbridge as he conducts that service over in Ballycastle Town. But as we come today, we, we come in the words of Hebrews chapter 10, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we come today humbly, but we also come boldly because of the blood of Jesus. We thank you that that blood has opened a way into your holy presence and that all those who repent of sin and who trust in the blood, that they, Heavenly Father, know you, that they, Heavenly Father, are given true hearts, assurance of faith, and we pray, Father, as we seek to meet with you today, that by your Spirit, you will meet with us. Father, be glorified in our hearts. Move us, we pray, by your Spirit. And be glorified for Jesus' sake. Amen. Oh, mm-hmm. 
Well, that was a, a good hymn to get us started this morning in our worship. We're going to read the scriptures in a moment, uh, Mark chapter 8. So do keep your Bible open at Mark chapter 8. And uh, before we get there, let's just join together in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, as we approach you in prayer, we confess that you are our God. Earnestly we seek you, our souls thirst for you, in a dry and weary land where there is no water. But Lord, you have opened the well of salvation, and on Calvary's hill we find your power and your glory, your love and your life. To have Jesus Christ, Lord, is to be satisfied, and we thank you that he is our saviour, our shepherd, and our star in the night. We pray this day, Lord, for the Smith family and their very dark night. Especially we think of Ryan today at the double funeral of his wife and daughter and of little Hannah in Belfast unable to be there for the funeral. Lord, give John Stanbridge, we pray, wisdom and compassion as he ministers at that funeral. And may the whole family circle find you in their darkness and the comfort that you alone can bring. We continue, Lord, to pray for our government, and we're thankful for glimmers of light at the end of the lockdown tunnel. We pray you would guide and lead those leaders, Lord, whether at Westminster or Stormont. And we're so glad, Lord, that you know the right things to do. And we pray that you would show the steps to take to those who are in places of power. And Father, we thank you that in the meantime, as we wait, and while there's no church, we have these online services. We thank you that people are tuning in, they're listening. And we pray, Father, for blind eyes to be opened, deaf ears to be unstopped, the mute to shout for joy, and for the dead to live. Father, as we read your word together now, we pray that you will speak to us through that word in the power of the Spirit. And may we sense, O oh God, today, the joy of the well of salvation, for we pray through Jesus Christ. Amen. So our Bible reading is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, quite a short reading, just verses 22 to 26. Let us hear the word of God. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spat on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people, they look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't go into the village. Amen. And we thank God for this reading from his word. Well, girls and boys, I've come to a different room in the manse for your talk. And I have behind me two clues. I wonder, can you look at these pictures? And I wonder, can you guess what I'm going to talk about? They're both scenes from a beach. Now there's a big clue. The tide is maybe out at this time. There's another clue. And what I'm going to talk about is wet. It's blue, especially in the, the sea. Have you guessed it yet? I'm thinking, of course, about water and lots of water. I'm thinking about the sea. And we've come today to the last man in our series on the letters in the alphabet. And we've come to someone that I'm going to call Mr. Zoo Keeper. Now, can you do a Z with your fingers? Just do a Z like that. Yeah. Mr. Zoo Keeper is the man I'm thinking about. And I wonder, can you guess who that is? He's in the book of Genesis. Yeah, it's Noah we're going to think about today. And you know the story of Noah. How the world was a, a wicked place. Lots of sin in the world and God had had enough 
of the way it was and God said there was going to be a flood to destroy the world. But because God is a God of mercy and a God of love and of grace, he told Noah to build a boat. And whoever went into the boat wouldn't be lost, but would be saved. So Noah began to build this huge boat. And as he was building it, he preached to people to, to get ready for the flood that was coming and to, to make plans to come into the boat. And the people just laughed. They thought he was mad. Until the day when Noah started to fill the boat and God had told him to put into the boat animals. You know that, two by two. And here we have got someone to help me with this morning doing the talk. What's your name? Is your name Crazy Crow? <laughs> yep, his name is Crazy Crow. So if the animals are there two by two and the birds and so on, Crazy Crow's great, 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 great granny and granda, they were there. Isn't that right, Crazy Crow? <laughs> yep, they were there. So they were in the lions, there was uh, tigers, there were dogs, there were cats, there were rabbits. Two by two of every animal were brought into the uh, ark. And the rains came and it rained for 40 days and for 40 nights. And for 150 days, the whole earth was covered with a flood. That's a long period of time. Everyone was lost. And then when the rain stopped and the 150 days had passed, God sent out, told Noah to send out a bird. Was it you, Crazy Crow? <laughs> nope, it wasn't Crazy Crow. The bird was a raven, a bit like you, Crazy Crow. <laughs> Black bird like that. And out went the raven. And the raven flew around, but it couldn't find anywhere to land. Then God sent out a dove, and the dove came back with a twig. And on the twig there were green leaves. And, and Noah knew that the water was going down, and that life had come back again to earth. And so the day came when the boat landed on a mountain, and Noah was able to open the door, and out went the people. And there were only eight on the boat, Noah and his wife, his three sons and his three daughter-in-laws, only eight people were saved and everyone else had been lost. But the animals, they were saved and they went out and the animals were able to uh, fill the world again and the animals were, were able to... Weren't you allowed to fly around? <laughs> yep, Crazy Crow, his granny and granddad were allowed to fly around and here we have Crazy Crow today. And girls and boys, that story is in the Bible. I know we're thinking about rainbows at this time. And by the way, I should say to you that you've only one more week for your rainbows to be sent in to me at 99 Ban Road. If you haven't yet sent them, do send, send it in. There's, only, there's about 33, 34, I think, on the window. And there's a prize when we're back in church again. But you know, that story is a reminder to us that yes, God is a God who, who judges, but he also is a God who saves. And he saves us not today, not through a boat, but through Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, turn away from sin, then you will be saved and you will be able to know the gift of God in your life, which is eternal life. So girls and boys, I'm sure you've liked seeing Crazy Crow today. You've liked seeing the, the pictures behind me of the sea and of the beach. Maybe we haven't seen the sea and the beach for quite some time. But we are reminded in this story of God's grace, of God's love, and of how there is hope through Jesus Christ. And if you've never asked him into your life, do it today and you will know the peace of God. Thank you for listening and may God bless you all. Amen. There is a
in the early 1970s when I was first becoming aware of pop music. There was a band on the go at that time by the name of Shawari Wari. I knew it was an awful name. And they had a song entitled Three Steps to Heaven and it went like this. Step one, you find a girl to love. Step two, she falls in love with you. Step three, you kiss and hold her tightly. Yeah, that sure sounds like heaven to me went the song. Now I'm not endorsing the song as a means of guiding you how to get to heaven. If you follow that advice you'll never get to heaven. But that concept of steps I want us to think about this morning. Step one and step two as we come to the healing of this blind man that we read about earlier in Mark chapter 8. This man is brought to Jesus by some of the townsfolk of Bethsaida. Jesus spits on the man's eyes and then puts his hands upon the man's eyes. The man says, I, I see trees like, I see people like trees moving around. And then Jesus again puts his hands on the man's eyes. And then he is able, he says, to see clearly his sight was restored. So it's a, a two-step uh, healing. And it's the one that I want us to think about this morning and to ask, what is the meaning of this for you and for me why is this here in the Bible? Well, first of all, it tells us about where spiritual darkness is dealt with and it is dealt with in Jesus Christ. Because clearly here, the townsfolk, their hope for this man to get out of the darkness was Jesus Christ. For centuries, the Jews had been waiting for a Messiah figure, for, for someone who would come from God, an anointed figure. And one of the marks of his coming would be that he would open the eyes of the blind. Isaiah, for example, says in Isaiah chapter 35, then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then in that day, in the day of Messiah, the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. And so the Jews here in the town of Bethsaida bring this blind man to Jesus. And they beg him to touch the blind man. Their hope is in Jesus. They've heard about Jesus. So now they look to him. They appeal to him. And they beg him to help this blind man. And isn't it true sometimes that those who are blind are the ones who, who don't look for help themselves. I'm thinking now of spiritual blindness. So many people are in spiritual blindness. And they're happy to stay in blindness. Happy to stay in the dark. But here are friends who are bringing this blind man to Jesus. Here is family perhaps who are 
bringing this man to Jesus. And there's real encouragement here to us to be praying. Maybe our family members, our friends aren't praying for themselves, but we can pray for them. Matthew Henry says this, If those that are spiritually blind do not pray for themselves, let their friends and relations pray for them, that Christ would be pleased to touch them. The second thing here, after showing us where hope is to be found, for the lifting of spiritual blindness, the importance of faith is highlighted in verse 23. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. And what a walk that must have been for that blind man to have been taken by the hand by a stranger and to have been led outside the village. What words, what comforting words must Jesus have said to that man? What wise words, what gracious and generous and kind words Jesus must have said to that man as he led him outside the town to a place that was unfamiliar, to a place that the man had maybe not been to before. He maybe wondered who this stranger was, but the kind, kindness of Jesus meant that he went along and he followed the Saviour. And wouldn't it be lovely to have a, a transcript of that conversation and what the Saviour said to him? A lot of us, it's true, isn't it, are feeling like we're drowning in the current coronavirus circumstances or to change the image, we're in the dark. We don't know where it's all going. We, we don't know where it's all going to end. But it's an invitation to trust the Lord, to put our faith in the Lord. As the hymn says, I know who holds the future and he'll guide me with his hand. With God, things just don't happen. With him, everything is planned. So as I face tomorrow with its problems, large and small, I trust the God of miracles. Give to him my all. And there is a, a real incentive in this current crisis that we trust the Lord. That he knows what he's doing, that he's leading us. And we put our faith into him. That takes me on then to the miracle itself. This two-step process that I began by mentioning at the start. By the way, this is the only miracle in the Bible that is a two-step process. Usually, Jesus, it's an instantaneous miracle. And this is also the only miracle uh, in Mark's gospel that doesn't appear in any other of the gospels. So there's something of a one-off nature about this miracle. I believe the reason for that is perhaps that we are not the stereotype conversions to Jesus Christ. When we talk about conversions, we tend to think about dramatic, sudden conversions like the conversion of the Apostle Paul in the Damascus Road or the conversion of the woman at the well in Samaria. And certainly, sudden conversions happen. But some conversions are more gradual, like a butterfly emerging from a cocoon. But the point is that you have responded to what Jesus Christ has done for you in Calvary's cross. Conversions don't happen automatically. There has to be a response to Jesus Christ. For some people, that's a dramatic response. For others, it's an ongoing response, an increasing response perhaps over time as they yield themselves to the Savior and they continually surrender their lives into his hands in greater ways than what they've done before. So that's why these steps are here. Jesus could easily have healed this man straight away, like he did the man born blind in John chapter 9. But for this man, it's in step. Step one, he spat in his eyes and put his hands on him. I see people, they look like trees walking around. Step two, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were open, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. So as we conclude then, what practical lessons can we draw from this incident? Let me give you three and then I'm done. First of all, is it not really the case that none of us sees everything straight away whenever we're converted to Jesus Christ? Being converted is like emerging from darkness, blinking into the bright sunlight of Messiah's day. Even take the Apostle Paul, I mentioned him earlier, dramatically converted to Christ on the road to Damascus, the, the bright light shining around him as he heard that voice from heaven. But what is he saying? Galatians chapter 1, verse 17. 
about the immediate aftermath of his conversion. He says, I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem. Why did he spend three years in the desert? Surely it was the process what had happened to him. It was to grapple with the scriptures to understand what had happened to him. As it's put elsewhere, it was to make his calling and election sure. To make every effort to add to his faith goodness, knowledge, self-control, stickability, godliness, kindness, love. For isn't it true, it really is true, none of us converted to Jesus Christ knows it all straight away. None of us is the finished article from day one. We start by seeing men as trees walking. But we don't stop there and some people stop there and that's a tragedy. But we keep looking to Jesus for more light, for more healing, for more grace. As Peter says, make your calling and election sure. Let us press on, said Jesus, to enter through the gate. The second practical lesson I want to to say this teaches us is the need for patience with those who haven't yet come through to see it all. Notice when the man says, I see tree, see people like trees walking around. Jesus doesn't laugh at him or rebuke him or write him off. Rather, Jesus intervenes again in his life with step two, putting his hands on his eyes so he can see everything clearly. Jesus is patient and gracious and helpful and kind. I wonder, Christian, As you see the example of Jesus here, are you like Jesus? Am I? An insightful lady was once hearing someone's testimony and she said to the person after she had heard the testimony, that's really lovely. Now let me ask you a question. Has it made you a nicer person? Has it made you a nicer person? Because you can claim conversion to Christ, but unless it has changed your life for the good, you've got to ask yourself, are you converted at all? Has your life become more like Christ? And especially when we encounter a believer who hasn't yet seen it all, who is feeling their way, who is emerging from the darkness, are we patient with them? Are we gracious? Are we helpful towards them? I remember as a young Christian, I had a friend and I used to ask him the daftest questions, but he was patient, he was gracious, he was helpful. And I'm forever grateful to him for that. And the final practical lesson I want to finish with. Maybe you're still spiritually in the dark as you listen to this message. You're a blind man. You're a blind woman. You haven't yet seen Jesus Christ. His death for for your sins on the cross. His resurrection from the dead. His ascension into glory. His coming again to judge the living and the dead. That judgment day is coming. And that final day of reckoning will soon be upon you. You must prepare to meet your God. Well, I believe if you ask him, the way he took this man by the hand and led him out of the town of unbelief, Bethsaida, Jesus had a very low opinion of Bethsaida, this this town in which these events had had taken place. He condemns it in, in Matthew chapter 11. He said that if the events Uh, uh, that that Bethsaida will be judged worse than Sodom and Gomorrah because of their unbelief. So Jesus takes this man by the hand out of the town of Bethsaida. And if you trust him, if you put your faith into Jesus Christ, ask him to convert you, ask him to open your eyes. He has your best, best interests at heart, the salvation of your soul, and he will lead you to a new and to a better place. Notice Jesus sent them home, verse 26, but don't go into the village. Don't go into the town. In other words, leave the town behind. Live a new life. Live in a place not of unbelief, but of belief. Not of darkness, but of light. It's no wonder Hebrews 12 says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So as I finish, fix your eyes on Jesus. And he will lead you from the place of darkness into the place of light. May God bless you and continue to speak through his word to your life.
Thank you for watching this morning broadcast and we trust the Lord has used it and blessed your heart through it as we have listened to his word and participated in, in an online act of worship. Don't forget tonight the evening broadcast is at half past six when we're 
back again in the book of Habakkuk. And uh, what a blessing that book has been to your soul. So do tune in tonight at half past six and we continue to look to the Lord to speak to your heart in these difficult days. But let's join together now as we close in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the words of the psalmist that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And we thank you, Father, that you are the God of light and of salvation. And we thank you, Father, we have seen that this morning in this man whom Jesus cured of his blindness and how he gave him a new life as a result. Help us, we pray, Lord, to continue to look to Jesus for light and to know that he is the one who is our light and our salvation. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and evermore. Amen.